I would be inclined to see here at the Chair Education Bridge. I do what you cannot do, what I can This is all God's will. An education into spiritual and practical abilities is necessary for the flourishing of all people, old and young mother. I entered Buckford Seminary at 17. We worked in those days as if we really believed that the potential statement of Aristotle, there is the same difference between the learned and the unlearned, and there is between the living and the dead. I bore away with me a lifelong enthusiasm for reading the Gospels in full, and an insurmountable distaste for having them chopped up in chapters and verses, or for hearing the incidents in the life of Jesus referred to as if they were merely records. When I first went to Calcutta as a missionary, I taught at St. Mary's School for Girls. I enjoyed my job as a teacher, but once I walked around the city and wrote out the four conditions that these children were living in, I changed my focus to that of working closely with those in poverty. By going into those slums, my teaching then involved solely in the sharing of Christ's blood. My education was a secular one, thank God. After earning my law degree in the 1960s at Brown University, and then serving as a judge, I ended Boxworth with honors in private law. Now I teach classes at a university in order to educate students about human rights. Well, while, both, while we both have had the privilege of receiving a higher education, I focused on biology and anatomy. You were the first one in Central or Eastern Africa to receive a do doctorate, did I understand? Yes, I was. I believe that a nonviolent education embracing environmentalism might help diminish the need for armed struggle. For reading and education that the world opened up to me, I was able to see clearly the issues that were shaping my life and the lives of those around me. <coughs> it would not have been possible if I had not earned a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics. In my time, we were not allowed to attend university, but many of us nonetheless thrived through personal studies of literature, music, language, and science, and other subjects. Learning was central to my own quest for attaining enlightenment. I spent my married years reading people and writing novels. While I was in college, on the evenings and weekends, I would read my books and spend my time in hospitals with meeting patients, providing comfort and teaching them to read. It was here that I first came to recognize the spirit that had ingrained the minds of so many people. Later, I became a research officer for the Royal Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the United Kingdom. And in that position, my interest in world politics was sparked. Out of all these experiences, I finally wrote Freedom from Fear. And yet it is, it is important to recall that there is more than one way to be educated. I remember walking among the poor of Chicago and asking them to try to help me understand the situation. Their words were more powerful and illuminating than any book I have ever read. I knew hundreds of young women who desired only one thing in life, and that was the opportunity to come and sacrifice themselves in the service of our Lord, to come and touch the lives of the poor. In my old age, I depended on the hope and love of these young women. I drank it like water. It had become difficult for me to imagine a bright future infused with God's love. There was so much hate for, separated, and darkness in the world, but not the minds of those young women. If we can but act locally while bearing in mind the reality of the world outside our neighborhood, we can all do small things with great love, and sometimes great things with great love, as you have done, Mother Teresa. There is nothing great about my love, but God's love passes understanding. The Burmese people call Suhi Da Aung San, which means An Aung San. What great trust they, trust they have in us. May I always marry that. It is your immersion of self in the lives of your people that has taught them to help you. Serving humanity is not your hobby, it's your way of life. Yet I never imagined that the Bring Up movement would have blossomed as it has. I just wanted to do something that could help my country during a difficult period. <coughs> just look at Kenya. After so many decades of colonial rule, we finally accomplished what seemed impossible. He assembled free, freely beneath the banner of unity and created an environment in which even warring tribes can voice concerns and opinions in a civil manner. The struggle has only begun, however, for it has even harder to maintain democracy than to achieve it. It took only one day to purchase Hull House, but it took our lifetimes to create a community center that was truly useful and in the views of some, a model of radical social change. Our efforts were worthwhile, for even one hour of safety for those who were unwanted elsewhere was enough to signify to many of them that hope was real. I will never forget the radical impression of the wretchedness of the overcrowded quarters of East London and Minden. Pale faces were dominated by that most unlovely of human expressions. The cunning and the shrewdness of the bargain hunter who starves if he cannot make a successful trade. My impression was not of ragged, tawdry clothing, nor of pinched and sallow faces, but of myriads of hands empty, pathetic, nerveless, and work-worn, showing white in the uncertain light of the street and clutching for food that was already unfit to eat. Yet it's hard to tell just when the very simple plan that afterwards developed into the settlement became 
began to form in my mind. But I gradually became convinced that it would be a good thing to rent a house in a part of the city where many primitive and actual needs were found, in which young women who had been given over too exclusively to study might restore a balance of activity along traditional lines and learn of life from life itself. I made up my mind, whatever happened, that I would begin to carry out the plan. The next January found me in Chicago, and, it, and in time it came to seem natural to all of us that the settlement should be there. If it is natural to feed the hungry and care for the sick, it is certainly natural to give pleasure to the young and comfort to the aged, and to minister to the deep-seated craving for social intercourse that all men feel. Someone to understand this craving for the love and company of humans to be a pale reflection of the craving for the love and company of our God. I became a Catholic when I was a teenager. I did, I did immediately after my father died, as this was my mother's wish. I was only four. I knew when I was 12 that I wanted to work with a missionary to become a nun. When I was 18, I took my vows and never saw my sister or mother again. I honor the ancient beliefs of my community, but I am also, like the two of you, a Catholic. I believe in God and that he has a kingdom that can put forward in heaven. Yet it remains our duty as Christians to create that kingdom on earth. The government's manipulated religion, as Shereen does. As a child, I was born into poverty. There was no opportunity for me to become a nun or to do anything except factory work for the landowners. I did not grow up in poverty, but I knew after arriving in Calcutta that God was calling me to devote my life to the poor. Everything in Guatemala, even religion, is manipulated by the government for its own ends. That's why my people finally rose up. As God's children, we should love each other and not resort to violence. Like you, the nuns in my village avoided my question about how to persuade the oppressors. They didn't understand us. Perhaps they were there to learn to understand you. We were born poor. <laughs> we were born poor and suffered a diet from malnutrition while the wealthy fed their, fed their dogs food that could have been saved for our families. What was sore? Perhaps the sisters did all they could under God's direction. They would not have been guided by man's logic. When I became a bride of Christ, I vowed to him that I would never refuse anything he asked me to do. It makes me sad when people do not understand and know his dedication. For instance, certain individuals criticized my close relationship with my spiritual advisor, and for time, made my life quite difficult. Criticism from the territory has been. I was proud of how it was, even though I was always being called for my need for advocating the destruction of all of them. Yet, I believe it was worth paying for this cause, no matter what it said about me. We must <laughs> never let those who do not understand the human world peace and love discourage them. Just saying peace and love is enough to make some of our listeners groaning, I suspect. Yet, obviously, the world can be much better than it is. I'm routinely accused of being a front for the CIA. When Hugo Chavez went on a weekly television address to say that I was a threat to the national security of Venezuela, I knew that I had arrived. I never intended to model myself after Lawrence of Arabia, but I can assure you, and I can also assure you I have no monopoly on the ideologically, ideological perspective that inspired Arabs throughout the North Africa and Middle East to fight for the regime change this spring. Peacemaking, as you all state, is ironically a very divisive enterprise. When I found out that Iran was accusing me of inspiring the 2009 election protest, I was used to be I was used to being a scapegoat for every despotic leader plagued by social unrest. Those whose power will be lost if the world becomes more just must see that we live our lives in fear and of confusion. When I defended Iran's Baha'i population, I received routine death threats. I arrived in London after being exiled in my own community. While in London, my prize, diploma, and other valuables were taken from me. I was denied my ability to practice law in the country that had given me my law degree simply because I'm gender. The examples are regrettably too numerous. As I spoke out more and more frequently against World War I, I was accused of being a communist and socialist. The New York Times, our most re respected school paper, called me unpatriotic, although I was doing everything I could to keep American lives. When I sat on the board of the NAACP, many white people looked at me with disgust. Of course, I'm considered unpatriotic as well. We must never give up our courage to advocate principles. I agree, Jimmy. I agree. Someday, people will recognize the importance of having a vision of the future that goes far beyond the possibilities of the present, and they will see that we have been all along. God and any human can find us, and yet sometimes I do not know. Sometimes I feel I have been abandoned. I do not believe feeling of emptiness came from my work or from the battle of poverty. If anything, living without material things has made my life very rich. The more you have, the more you are occupied with what you have, and the less you can get, the less you have, the more. 
more free you are. Mother Teresa, I can see why so much to do. Let us not talk about that. If I ever become a saint, I will have to be one of the dark. Enough about me. <laughs> You're as nearly as complicated as Alfred. Alfred? No, Belle. We're friends. I never knew a more contradictory person. He spent most of his energy devising better weapons. Yet, he did listen to my arguments eventually and leave money for, among other things, the fifth category of Nobel Prize which is the of the personal society that renders the greatest service to the cause of international fraternity and the suppression or reduction of standing arms or the establishment or furtherance of peace conferences. I worked for him for a short time, after which we correspond regularly for the rest of our lives. I did not expect to receive the prize myself or that I would be the first woman so honored. I wrote not only to Alfred, of course, but to many other prominent people in whom I attempted to wait to embrace international arbitration as a civilized world solution to the problem of war. Mother Teresa, I believe that you were also fond of her. In fact, my correspondence was a source of great pain to me. I begged the father to destroy all of my letters, but they would not. I constantly exchanged letters with Father Von Hessen and Archbishop Pierre because I was so anxious to start helping them and extreme me in the way I knew Jesus wanted me to. I hoped that by writing frequently, I could demonstrate to the fathers how important this cause was to me. Whether letters, the letters served any real purpose, however, I knew. I certainly had to wait what seemed like my time for words of encouragement and for the final approval of God's plan. You have touched the lives of so many, Mother Teresa. Like you, people need to give back to the world. A life, regardless of our approach to religion or spirituality, a society without charity is a desert. Do you know Jesus? When I attended Rockford Seminary, I had to memorize a verse from the Bible every day and listen to a sermon on the verse by my physical. By the time I finished at Rockford, I knew the Bible and especially the New Testament thoroughly. Having studied it closely during my young life, although my father had been out, devout Quaker, I converted Presbyterian. When I was a young girl, Jesus was my complete inspiration. We are all women of faith. Shireen writes that Islam has provided her with resources, strength, and inspiration. Myself, I found inspiration in the words of Christ in the New Testament. One thing that many found striking was how you were able to provide a school for those who sought it, food for those who needed it, music and drama for those who want to express themselves. You were able to do this without preaching your faith. I am a Muslim woman who will always hold the words of the Prophet of Islam dear to my heart. However, in the fight for social, social justice, let us put aside religion. If we wear our religion on our sleeves, we will never agree. But if we can put aside our religious differences and focus on common battles, we can unite at last. We make the decision not to make Paul House a settlement to Christians only. Though I am not against seeking conversion, I see it as not sufficient in and of itself. Religion has played a central role in my life, but some would say not, not so in my social world. Yet to feed, clothe, tend, and encourage the poor with the essence of Christ's work. Historically, my government has gained the people's trust by reflecting our religious ideals. However, the government of Iran has been violating human rights for decades. Respectfully, Mother Teresa, do you believe that any country ruled by religion, even Christianity, would be in a similar state? Miss the body and the just injustice aimed by your government against its own citizens is inhumane. As for me, my one mission was to spread the love of Jesus to all that I know. That still does not answer the question. Forgive me, child of God. I cannot say if I believe in circumstances you would be the same if the country were to be ruled through Christianity. But I did not advocate that people should govern through religion. My aim was not one of government, but of religion. For I aim to help people who do not believe follow the path of God and find their life. In this way, I have to follow my husband, Jesus Christ, who chose to spend his life among the poor and refused to take one on, take on a kingly mantle when offered it. With all respect, Mother Teresa, it seems to me that you have nothing to believe in besides Christianity. But I believe life has much more to much more to it than religion. I do not believe that any religious framework has yet appeared that can consistently promote human rights. Regrettably, in every religion there is an outsider, and at least our religions require a degree of submission to what a priest or pastor or cleric says in, it is in the words of God. Notice that women are usually being told what to believe by men. Human rights will never be respected by adopting one set of religious beliefs as the official posture of the state. You are quite a powerful speaker in this body. It seems that you will say whatever you please to whoever you please. 